Hi, this is uh, Connor Hibbard, 92 WICB's Jazz and Specialty Music Director, and I'm here with the fabulous uh, Christine Lavin. Christine, how are you today? I'm doing good, you know, under the circumstances. We're all yeah. just, you know, muddling through as best we can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess we should start off uh, by disclosing that we are both from the Finger Lakes, uh, more specifically Geneva, which is how I kind of introduced us, I suppose. Um, so I, what, what was it like for you growing up in this, I, I kind of consider this area and many uh, in the, you know, the entire Finger Lakes area to be kind of a hidden gem in the nation and, and in the world. So how, how was it growing up in Geneva in such a small area with such a small music scene and, and, uh, and growing your taste there? Well, you know what? My family didn't move there till I was 17. And oh, they've wow. written many times that I'm a Geneva native. And I, I always, you know, tell them, no, I was born in Peekskill, New York. But, um, but I'm sort of proud of the fact that they like to think of me. And they brag about me as a Geneva native. And it's, it's a lovely, lovely area. But I was uh, already in college. I went to Brockport, which is not too far uh, from Geneva, just on the, uh, the west side of Rochester. And uh, so one of my earliest gigs was playing at Hobart College on the radio, live on the radio, when I was about 19 years old. And it, would, it was a real lesson learner for me because I was drinking Boone's Farm wine. <laughs> I'm so against alcohol on stage for performance. And I have been for decades, but back then. <laughs> and luckily, I heard a tape of that interview and that performance and I thought, oh, I thought I sounded cool drinking Boone's Farm wine. I did not. So that kind of cured me right away. Wow. I've never, I knew, I, I have heard of people like radio personalities drinking on air, but I've never heard of a, a special guest star drinking on Well, you know what? It was actually, it was uh, from their coffee house. So it was okay. like a live performance. So yeah, oh, I've never done it. You know, <laughs> I was, I was a bad girl. I, in fact, you know, I, I was going to call one of my albums Bad Girl Trapped in a Good Girl's Body <laughs> until I Googled that phrase and found out it was a catchphrase for a porn site. And I thought, oh, that's not good. <laughs> by the way, I live right by the Manhattan Bridge, and mm -hmm. you can probably hear it. That's a subway train rumbling from, there it is. from Brooklyn to Manhattan right outside my window. That's a nice ambiance. Nice oh, no, it's not. It, it <laughs> happens. Uh, seven times, I mean, every seven minutes. And uh, I have to run air conditioners and fans and white noise machines at night so that I can sleep through it. It runs, I'm not a, I'm, I'm obviously not from Manhattan. So does it run like at all hours of the day? Yeah, even when they had shut down the subways from one o'clock till five o'clock, right at the beginning of the pandemic, they were still running every seven minutes. I actually sat up all night and timed it and I thought, what are they talking about? They're they're off between one and, and five in the morning. No, they're not. So, yeah, who knows? Have you ever have you ever written a song about those trains? Because uh, you've just released uh, your twenty fifth solo album, so you've got quite the discography. So I. Uh, yeah, well, one of the songs is called "Until That Day," and it's about how my parents met on the New York City subway way way back before World War Two, and um, I got the idea for the song about a year. Was it about a year ago? No, maybe it was, I can't, it was within the past year. I was actually riding on the subway and I was watching this little boy who was tugging at his mom's dress, trying to get her attention. And she was absorbed in her cell phone and she had headphones on. And right next to her was a really good looking guy who was also absorbed in his cell phone and headphones. And I thought, my God, you know, they're both in their, look like they're in their early twenties. This could have been my parents, you know, Mm -hmm. 70, 80 years ago. And these two are never going to meet because they're staring at their cell phones. And we still, we, we have no idea what the long-term effects of all of this right. uh, technology is going to be. But, uh, but if not for the New York City subway, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, so changing gears a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like I mentioned, you you just released your 25th solo album, On My Way to Hooterville, which I deeply love. Um, I, oh, as thank I, as you. I, of course, as I love uh, all your all your albums. And I, I um, as a little personal anecdote, so 
those who don't know my voice and are, are watching this interview, I'm the host of Hobo's Lullaby, which is the WICB uh, folk Americana and bluegrass program. And I came across uh, your CD, Happy Dance of the Xenophobe, in the, the CD closet one time. And I, 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 I knew your name um, because of your Geneva connection. But I, I, I put in that, that CD and I just flipped to Tom Cruise Scares Me because I thought <laughs> it just sounded funny. And I have been hooked on that ever since. And that's kind of your, you have a lot of those more comical songs and, and a lot of times um, the folk genre can get pretty heavy in its, in its theme. So was there a conscious decision that you made to go to delve deeply into that comical side? Not that you're not, not capable of, of all forms of songwriting, but, but was that a conscious decision or did that just kind of evolve? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, as a songwriter, it, songwriting to me is a very mysterious process. I don't know when songs are going to hit and when they're not. And when they do want to be written, they won't leave you alone. <laughs> they're like the little boy talking, like, write me, write me, write me. And um, very often I try to write a serious song. Of, I mean, an example, this is a very old example, but uh, way back in the 1980s, I was a secretary at Gray Advertising in New York. And um, I got a crush on this account executive named Russell who uh, wore a suit every day and was, you know, had big plans for his future. I could tell that. And, um, and I, it was a ridiculous crush because he was so not interested. And I tried to do everything possible to run into him, and make it look like an accident. And um, he, he, because he wasn't interested, I tried to write a serious song about the stupid things you do when you get a workplace crush. Because it's, they usually don't work out. I mean, sometimes they do but I think most times they're not going to work out. And so that's what I was trying to write when I ended up writing a song called Doris and Edwin, the movie. It's a disaster movie in the form of a song. And in my song, Doris works in the basement and Edwin works on the 37th floor. In reality, I was on the seventh floor and he was on the 11th floor. And um, she tries to run into him and make it look like an accident. And then one day, because the building, there was construction fraud when the building was made. I, I wonder who the contractor was, the builder, but we won't go there. But um, the building catches on fire and the alarms don't go off until it reaches the 37th floor. And he jumps out the window eventually out of desperation. And she comes running up out of the building and he lands on top of her and they both die. And they get buried together. So they end up together forever. That's not what I was trying to write. <laughs> But that's what I wrote. And, uh, you know, and I recorded it back in the 1980s. And then, of course, after 9-11, I stopped doing that song. Right. And, but people, enough time has gone by now that people ask for it all the time. And I, I've done it a few times online, but only by request. Right, right. Um, and that's, that's a, a, a thing. I think that's what drew me specifically to the, to the folk genres is, I mean, in so many... You can tell a story through music in any genre, but folk, I guess, is the most, often is the most literal, I think, of, of people like Harry Chapin and Bob Dylan, for example, and, and, of, and of your music. So is that, well, yeah, go ahead. But I was going to say, you just mentioned Harry Chapin. I went to Brockport State College, and in all four years, I went to every concert, every music concert, every dance concert, everything, because I was so thrilled to be surrounded by so much creativity. And Harry Chapin was the best concert I ever saw in four wow. years. Wow. Have, did you ever see him live? I've not. Um, I'm not sure when when he died. Um, oh, it was quite a while ago. He, he had a heart attack driving on the Long Island Expressway. It was, it was horrible. But I'm friends with his brother, Tom. I do a lot of shows with Tom Chapin, who's also wonderful. But Harry Chapin had that special something. Uh, absolutely. Um, but 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 is that is that kind of storytelling um, form what drew you to to folk music? Or, or? I, I think so. It also draws me to to films. I love films that span a lifetime or tell a really long complicated story i just heard a great song um it was sent to me by a guy named john weingart who has a, a long-running radio show in um princeton new jersey called music you seldom you i think it's music you seldom hear on the radio jane godfrey j-a-n-e-g-o-d-f-r-e-y 
and her song is called Breakfast, and that's all I'll tell you about it. All right. But it's but it's one it's an example of a song that begins in one place. And one of the things I love about really good songwriters is that sometimes the last line or the last two lines or the last verse surprises you completely and leaves you in a such a different place from where you started out with the song. And she's that kind of songwriter. And I'm so glad I am beyond the age of envy because normally I, you know, if I was younger and I heard something like that, I'd be so depressed. Like, why couldn't I write a song like that? But now I want everybody here. So Jane Godfrey. We like to, we like to leave our listeners in suspense. So that'll be perfect. You can, you can listen to this interview, then you can go out and find it. You'll be surprised. Yeah. Yeah, but what if they've they've gone they've dialed away now and they're checking around and I lost them. Hopefully I don't care. <laughs> yeah, come back, come back. As long as they hear a good song, that's what that's what really matters. Yeah. While we're on the subject, I guess this is a question I ask um, each artist I interview, and the answer is pretty much always the same. But it might be different for you because you've written so many songs. Is there? Do you have a favorite? Is there one that holds a a, a place in your heart? that the others cannot touch? Hmm. You know, I think right now I do. And usually if you ask a songwriter that, it's going to be the most recent song they've written because we always fall in love with our most recent song until we realize later, oh, maybe it needs work. (laughs) But I wrote a song a couple years ago called um, Grandpa and the Empire State Building. And I made a video for it. And when I I was living in Geneva, actually from um, 2010 to 2012, when my mom was really slipping with her memory. And um, I taught myself how to make videos just so I could videotape little things she did during the day and show her because she couldn't remember. And she loved watching these videos. And now that she's gone, it's heartbreaking for us to watch some of these videos. But um, because I, I taught myself to do that for her. It was, took me a couple of years to realize I could start making videos for my own songs. So I actually write differently if I have a video in mind. And the song, it's a nine minute song. It's about my grandfather who had offices in the Empire State Building. The history of the building, of the building of the building and why it broke all the records and how it it took 17 years before the offices were filled. The building was mocked when it was first built because it was not near any of the important subway lines. They thought, why would you build it there? And now, you know, especially after 9-11, it became even more of an icon for New York City. And, And what I love about doing that song, when I can when we were doing live concerts, I would sing, I would sing live to the video and people would come up to me and tell me stories about their family's connection. And I'll tell you one, one of the great stories I heard, this woman said that um, it was, it, it was July, I think July 25th, 1945, when that airplane uh flew into the 79th floor. It was a military plane. And of course the pilot was killed and just a few people were killed because it was a Saturday, which was kind of a lucky thing. And her grandfather who had an eighth grade education was a, an, uh, an immigrant from Russia was up in the Catskills with his family having a summer vacation where lots of, it was a Russian Jewish man up there with his family. And um, after the accident happened, there was this mad scramble to find this guy because he was considered the best steel worker in all of New York City. They tracked him down. I think it was at Kutcher's. I think that's where she told me he was. And they said, would you come back immediately, like right now, drop your fork, come back tonight and oversee the rebuilding of what, all the repair work has to be done on the Empire State Building. And he said, yes, he would. And so they sent a limousine to pick him up, to drive him back to New York. And his overseeing the repairs was so good that on Monday, this accident happened on Saturday, on Monday, the build, the entire building was open for business. It did not affect any of the other tenants in the building. And to this day, 
this woman and her family brag about their, I guess it was her great grandfather who oversaw the repairs to the Empire State Building. They sent a limousine and he only had an eighth grade education. Wow. And I wish I had known that story. I probably would have had a verse in the song about him. But one of the interesting things I did find also doing research for that song is that most of the workers were immigrants who worked on the building. There were 3,400 workers and there were about 800 of them were Mohawks from Canada um, who, who were Canadian, but the rest, most of the rest of them were all immigrants. So that's, you know, I'm a grandchild of immigrants. Are, are you, do you have immigrants in your family history? Um, yes, my great grandmother, not, not anyone uh, super close to me in, in age, I guess, or not, yes. Yes, is the, the, the answer. <laughs> Yeah, so see, you're, you're the great grandchild of immigrants, I'm the grandchild of immigrants, and it's what's made our country, you know, the, the country that it is, and, and great in so many ways because of the pluralism, and we all bring special gifts, and we all work together. And um, one of the things I've done before I do that song with live audiences, I ask people to raise their hand if they're child of, if they're immigrants or child of immigrants or great. And by the end of my asking, 90% of the audience has their hands raised. So it's good. To, it's a nice, gentle reminder for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. And here I, I'm still captivated by your, your stories, even not in song form. Um, uh, so I, I guess we'll we'll transition here to your your most recent album, twenty your twenty fifth solo album, as I've said a couple of times, uh, on my way to Hooterville, um, which again I, I I really enjoy, and there is one song that you're going to perform for us in, in in just a few moments, um, from that album that I I appreciate because of its connection to Geneva, my sister Mary and my mother, and the video for that song is is like you said a lot of those home videos. I think it opens up with you singing um, You Are My Sunshine, which I thought was absolutely beautiful. Um, um, I, guess, I guess I don't really have a very specific question about this song. Just take me through your, through your thought process writing the song. and, and uh, Well, it's an interesting one because um, my sister Mary, who lives in Rochester, she just retired from the School of the Arts. She was a history teacher there. Um, she, over the years, was really the most attentive to our mom. She would make the round trip from Rochester to Geneva at least twice a week. And mom loved to go out in the car and just get away, you know, with, with no short-term memory. She always thought she just arrived at the nursing home where she was. And one day, and their favorite thing to do was to get ice cream by the lake and just sit by the lake and just enjoy the, the beautiful weather and the people strolling by. And one day they're sitting there when something dramatic happened from the animal kingdom. And, uh, and my mother said something quite moving at, after they witnessed what they did. And my sister came back and told us all about it. And I thought, oh my goodness, this, this should be a song. And, but I didn't feel that I had the song in me. This is maybe five or six years ago. So I told a lot of my songwriting friends what my mother said. I said, somebody should write this into a song. And nobody did. And so the, earlier this year uh, for Mother's Day, the foundation at the Rachel Bissick's Facebook page, she's a folk singer who died a few years ago, young, it was very sad. And they were having a Mother's Day songwriting challenge. And I had written the lyrics when I was at Yado last September. I, I was lucky enough to, to get an appointment to a lot of, to a lot of <laughs> Yado for a month. And I had the lyrics and I thought I had only to go with it. I realized, no, I, that, that is the whole song. So, so you want me? To, oh, and, and then <laughs> I needed the footage of what happened. And uh, luckily for me, the Finger Lakes Times, the editor there ran a story saying that I'm looking for footage of, of the, the animal kingdom action in the song. And I was going to pay $100 because that's I, this song won the Rachel Bissick's songwriting challenge. And I got $100 for it. So I said, OK, I'm going to give the $100 to whoever can come up with the footage. And it's in the video. It's at ChristineLavin.com. It's very easy to find. It's called 
my sister Mary and my mother. Oh, wait a minute, I have to turn on, turn off original sound. I forgot about that for Zoom. I don't know if you could tell the difference. I never can. <laughs> sister Mary love visiting mom she take her out for a ride they both enjoyed the open road the gently rolling countryside so different from the nursing home where she'd sit in a chair thinking she had just arrived wanting to get away from there drive past farms and sometimes stop by fruit and fresh picked corn gather sunflowers and wild roses being careful with the thorns but most of all they love to sit quiet by the lake eating vanilla ice cream spray swooped on down right out of the blue doe feet first into the lake the way that our sprays do I would emerge with a great big lake trout wriggling in its claws oh my sister Mary and my mother watched it defying gravity's law Left its wings so hard, struggled with the weight of a lake trout that no doubt now had an elevated heart rate. Boom, boom, boom. There goes the trains. Oh, there's two of them. <laughs> oh, my sister Mary and my mother watched this, witnessed this dramatic show. Beauty in all of its splendor, nature in all of its splendor, beauty, wonder, whoa. They watched the bird and wriggling fish disappear into the sky. Then my mother said, I hope that fish had a dream to fly. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you so much for performing that. I love that song. Very oh, simple. Thank you. I'm sorry I flubbed it a little bit, but oh, you know no what? worries at all. No worries <laughs> at all. That's part of the songwriting process. Yeah. And like you said, you don't have all the all the performances to, to inundate yourself with it as much. So mm. absolutely. Um everyone, well everyone. I'm speaking in the, the future tense. Uh Christine Lavin uh, and Connor Hibbert for 92 WICB. Christine, thank you very much. You're so welcome.